you know, along with talking to the locals and having those conversations about whether we were going to save their house or not, uh, that was equally as uh, uh, mentally draining and, and um, hard to handle inside. My name is John McNeil, I'm a Division Chief for Ventura County Fire Department and my responsibilities are uh, the western uh, end of the county and within that is uh, our Wildland and Air Division, all the operations and administrative uh, needs for that area. I have battalion chiefs that run battalions and within those battalions you have your fire stations. So I have two battalions, uh, the areas of Malibu, Piru, uh, El Rio, Ojai, Rincon, up into the Lockwood Valley. So a big geographic area, not necessarily our highest population in the county. And then another area is our uh, air and wildland division, which has our hand crews, our bulldozers, our helicopters, and I have a battalion chief that runs that. So I was uh, commuting back from my office in uh, El Rio, you know, we have mobile computers in our in our vehicles. So I saw the call pending, and I knew we had weather. We had uh, the department had prepared for it, and and uh, we had what we call upstaffed. So with weather forecasted in current conditions, and seeing the information on the screen and the location, my supervisor called me on the phone right away, and he started asking questions about details and maybe putting a plan together, a, a longer term plan, knowing the conditions and where this thing could be going. Give you a quick update on the fire condition. Right now, we're looking at about 500 acres being pushed downhill into the city of Santa Paula. We've established two branches east and west of the Highway 150 corridor. When I was on uh, Highway 150 uh, leaving the Upper Ojai and you approach uh, uh, Thomas Aquinas College and it turns to the right and you start heading into Santa Paula proper, and that's where I saw the fire initially. And it was down in the creek bed right there, Santa Paula Creek. At that point, it was still going down the creek and threatening to go across the highway. We had resources coming from Ojai, and a couple were in front of me. When I say resource, fire trucks, the Forest Service was also coming out of the Ojai area. They had upstaffed, and they had six engines in route initially, and that's part of an agreement we have. When we have a, an incident uh, like that, we branch it. We call it branching it. And so you'll have an incident commander uh, that oversees everything, and then we'll, we'll break it down into smaller pieces. Well, about the time we had decided what that was going to look like and kind of deciding on a few initial priorities and objectives on how we were going to manage this, we get information that there's a, either a second fire or a spot fire in the Koningstein Road area. From our location at Mill Park, it's about four miles to the northwest. And we all started looking at it. That can't be the same. It can't be from the same fire. It's upwind, it's uphill, and it's just it goes against all thought on being part of this fire. So I said, I'm going to go check that one out. If it's established in there, then let's just make it another branch, and we'll just, we'll just get, get a little wider with that. So I left Mill Park, and that's where I went. It started on Koningstein Road, and when you put your back to the wind from where the fire was, and that gives you a general idea where it's going, it was going right to the center of all those homes in that valley. So it couldn't have been in a worse spot. So again, two to three acres in there. We did have some helicopters up. They were challenged with the weather, primarily the wind, but we were given the priority for the aircraft. So we had uh, one helicopter flying overhead. So I got made communication with uh, the helicopter right away because they can give us a better perspective of what's going on. Confirmed two to three acres, not really spreading much at this point because it was kind of a bit sheltered from the wind, uh, but definitely some homes threatened, immediately threatened. So we put resources in there to try and evacuate. Initial actions uh, on a typical fire would be to make sure people are out of the way and then attack the fire and, and try and put it out, and uh, especially around the houses, and then do some kind of perimeter control to keep it from spreading to get bigger. The only thing we could do was just try and get to the homes, get people out of the homes that wanted to go. Uh, some did decide to stay, and that just adds a, a liability piece that becomes a bit of a challenge later on. But that's where all of our efforts were. Not only were we watching the fire to see where it was going and anticipate where it was going, but we were all of our efforts were to knock on doors and, and uh, get people out of harm's way. So our station 20, uh, fire station 20, is, is right in the bullseye of where that thing was going and it's surrounded by most of the population up there. So we decided to uh, relocate down there. We had some resources that stayed committed to work on those priorities and then the rest of the resources I had to come into station 20 and we gathered up and we had a conversation about, hey, you know, this is what we're going to do, these are the areas that we're concerned with. In about 20 minutes it finally worked its way up the hillside on the south side and then 
and got the influence of the wind because prior to that it was sitting down sheltered from the wind so it was a little slow to get out of there but once it came out it came out as we predicted but I will say in 30 plus years of doing this I, I did underestimate the speed at, at, of the, the rate of spread on that thing and so my estimates I, I guys I think I think we have you know 20 minutes 30 minutes before it starts hitting these first homes and you know so let's get positioned up and you know it was there in half the time and then it continued to outpace my my thought until about maybe 45 minutes into it and I realized okay I, I, I get it now I, I can't keep making the same mistakes it came out of that original area on Koningstein, and it really came out two different ways. It went straight down Koningstein Road, where, where a bulk of the houses were, which was more of a north wind influence. The wind we had on it was more of a northeast, so my assumption was it was gonna go a little bit uh, along the upper side of those homes. So it actually split and went both ways. You know, more and more of these challenges kept getting thrown at us, and I would, of course, ask for more resources, knowing I wouldn't get them, most likely. And as the night went on, it got into the populated areas, and it, it was, fairly destructive in that area. I mean, I think per capita in the county, that was the hardest hit uh, area in the county. Our route, the Highway 150, a section of the highway between Santa Paula and Ojai, became cut off because the fire had, a, the original fire we were dealing with out of uh, Steckel Park area, had crossed the highway and burned some power poles, and all these power poles are now laying across the road as were rocks that rolled off and trees that had fallen across the road, so it completely blocked access. So now everyone that's gonna come up and assist our efforts in Upper Ojai would have to drive through Ojai Valley and up uh, you know, 150 from Ojai Valley. So it just, it took a lot longer to get there. I'm local to the area and I had, I had friends that live up there in that immediate area of Upper Ojai and, and I took a call from one of them and I was in his driveway because he asked, hey, can you check on my house? He had evacuated and at one point he asked, he goes, what are the chances of saving my house? And I, I gave a 50-50 chance. I go, I, I go, Doug, I don't have enough resources to, get, to do what we really want to do here, you know. Our focus is to get everyone out, everyone's out of your house, so we're moving on to other houses to make sure they're clear. This is the first time in 30 plus years of doing this, I've had this much destruction, but the local feel of it, and that's what really, uh, I mean, it's still, kind of gets my skin to move a little bit. And uh, so it just, and he was just one story in, the, in that local part of the story. So we continued on until daybreak and then the next day doing the same thing. So that fire eventually progressed across the highway and uh, started moving toward Sulphur Mountain, the ridge, uh, which was burning now toward the, the, the first fire that started. Of course, there's homes up there. There's people that we had to get out of harm's way, and then we have the Doppler radar. So we're looking at priorities on where to, to put resources. So the, the radar is a, a, a big priority, as were the homes and the lives that were still up there. We couldn't get him down 150 to Santa Paula, and the evacuation uh, shelter was uh, being set up at uh, the fairgrounds, so we routed him down through Ojai. But yeah, we did get everyone out. Although there were quite a few residents in the upper Ojai that took action upon themselves, and we realized they weren't leaving, so we just coordinated our efforts with them. And, you know, it adds a challenge and a liability that we would rather not uh, deal with, but if they're staying and they're doing work, then we were given some guidance where we could and moving on to another one. The pace of the fire was you know, incredible. I think it's been documented well. The typical action, like I said, the priorities were make sure everyone's out of harm's way. Second to that, see if, what houses you can stay and defend. So they were clearing them and then they would stay and defend a house. They would defend it as the fire passed passed on, the idea is to kind of stay up in, ahead of the fire. Well, they realized they were leaving a little sooner than they wanted to, for sure. So they would defend a house, feel that it's good to go. They move to the next one and just, you know, the idea was to be efficient and save as many as you can with limited resources. Someone would return back to the house they thought they had just saved and now it's now it's involved. Um, and it was the wind, the conditions, the, uh, the fuels, the, uh, so many things were, were against uh, the, the fire crews in, in those situations. So they realize now they got to adjust their pace. They've got to stay on the house longer to make sure it's, it's absolutely safe. And while you're doing that, you're watching downwind homes uh, end up you know, being lost. So that was, that was hard for the, for the crews to adjust to that pace because it was, it was different than what we're used to seeing in the, in the past uh, well, few years for sure. 
You know, so this is, you know, we're engaging this at uh, 7 p.m. and now it's midnight. We're starting to get day breaks. So we're 12, 13, 14 hours into this. And you're starting to get moments where you can just take a breath and have some conversations with some of the crews. And you're realizing the risks that are being taken. And I had some good friends that were captains on some of those engines working for uh, some of our officers up there. And there were moments where they had engines that couldn't get in or out of certain areas. They, they were basically trapped in there and they were having to uh, what we call ride it out or, or just stay put and let the fire burn through. Uh, given a choice to do it again, they would have never committed into the area. They would have come in after or, or at least uh, give themselves more room, and less risk. Every one of the crews there had the same stories. And it was story after story after story. And now the concern as, a, uh, as one of the uh, commanders is, okay, we're 12, 13, 14 hours into this. The risk they're taking, how clear are they thinking? You were just almost waiting for to hear something on the radio, someone getting hurt, an engine getting burned over. I mean, things that we do not hear uh, often, if ever, in, in our department. But you could see what was happening, the risks that were taken, the heroic actions. And at some point, the body can only take so much. It can only think so clear. and. and and perform physically uh, for so long. And we were getting into that area of time. And I, so we, we had a bit of a reset and just made, we, made sure we had conversations with our crews that we're gonna, we're gonna continue to be here and, and the pace isn't slowing down. So find balance that way and, and manage your crews and, and minimize that risk. So, you know, along with talking to the locals and having those conversations about whether we were gonna save their house or not, uh, that was equally as uh, uh, mentally draining and hard to handle inside. We, we know it as leaders and it's like, wow. And, and sometimes it's not even possible to pull it back. That's their mode of operation for the last 20 years and, and it's not gonna change now. And if there's still challenges in front of you, they're gonna continue to go after them. That was the toughest part. And then at some point, um, it was about daybreak. And, and my role is, you know, trying to manage the big picture of that piece of the fire. 